good game. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. Well, Bajo, I did it. I spent a week playing Dark Souls 3 for our review tonight. And you'll be happy to know I took your advice. Death is your reward. Start hacking at a spot. But if he turns around, run, 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 run. No! No! Also on the show tonight, is it a TV show? Is it a video game? Or an awkward combination of both? Quantum Break. I've been on a powerhouse over the past... Plus, Nick Boy escapes the studio to meet developer Arnie Meyer for a first play of Uncharted 4. Right. So this is no shortcuts. No, no <laughs> shortcuts. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? Legends say, never approach the island. It's been six years since developer Remedy's last full game, the truly excellent Alan Wake. So let's shatter time with Quantum Break. Quantum break, quantum break, quantum break. Remember this moment. Quantum Break is a choice consequence narrative thriller and a third person shooter. Get ready for a whirlwind time bending experience with a stellar cast. You begin as Jack Joyce, played by X-Men's Sean Ashmore, who is invited to help with the final stages of a time travel experiment by your old friend Paul Serene, played by Game of Thrones' Aidan Gillen. In the flesh. The esteemed Mr. Paul Serene. And since when do time travel experiments ever go right? <laughs> Within minutes, shit hits the fan, and an accident leaves you imbued with time-controlled powers, while the universe is put on an apocalyptic crash course with the end of time itself. Yes. Now, being a game that's so focused on story with plenty of spoilers, I think it's best that we don't say too much about the plot itself. But what a cast, though, Barjo. Oh, yeah. Two actors from The Wire popped up in the first hour, and I was in. Top-tier stuff. <laughs> As you know, Jack's level of interference led to unexpected complications. It's a great time travel story, and it plays with all of those tropes beautifully. And I think if Looper and Doctor Who have taught us anything about time travel storylines, is that they're often messy and confusing and a bit stupid. But I didn't find any plot holes in this. It's super impressive. Yeah, it's all handled really cleverly. And as soon as you find yourself kind of asking, well, why don't they just do that? Some character seems to come along and ask the same question, and then someone else will explain why they can't. The past has already happened. We can't change it. But my way, we don't have to. And I thought Aiden Gillen especially played his role perfectly. You know what this means? You don't know for sure. I'm a dead man! You let this happen! One of this game's big features is that they've incorporated a whole TV show into the game. At the end of each act, you're treated to a live action half hour episode of Quantum Break, the TV show. Now, Remedy did a great job with the whole episodic TV feel of Alan Wake, but generally, I don't like 25-minute cutscenes spliced into my games. Yeah, and long cutscenes can often lose me at the best of times, but I actually think this worked quite well. And maybe it's just the fact that I knew I could put the controller down and just sit back and enjoy some story for a bit. Liam, this isn't what it looks like. As opposed to more traditional cutscenes where I'm just waiting to get back into the action, or worse, I think I can put the controller down and go get a snack, and then there's a quick time event and I'm like, ah! Yeah, it won me over pretty quickly too. And it's not as intrusive as I thought it would be. There's only four episodes in a 10 hour or so experience, so, you know, they paced it out well. Yeah, plus the show tackles events from the other perspective, the Monarch Corporation, which helps to flesh out the villains and the story in a way that other games tend to struggle with. Mm. Also, before each episode starts, you switch over to play as Paul for a few minutes and get to make a decision on how the story plays out in what are called junction moments. Initialize a PR campaign. I want to stay. And that violence was because of Jack Joyce. And this will affect what happens in both the show and the game. The decisions do feel quite significant, but I retried the first junction and I couldn't really see how much that other option affected the TV show itself. And maybe it does a lot more further down the line, but I think to really see that, we'd have to do full two playthroughs, put them side by side and just analyse everything. <laughs> but you can skip them if you really want to, and I do think the gameplay story itself would hold up enough without them. The show itself too is quite B-grade, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, but they've clearly spent a bit of money on it. There are enough gunfights, fisty cuffs, and car chases to spice things up. The acting is mostly good, but there is some cringe here and there. Look, what's the 411? 
What the hell's going on out there? <laughs> the 411. Yeah, the 411. <laughs> Uh, everything's, everything's fine. Everything's fine? Everything's fine. Despite having an A-list cast, most of the big-name actors have pretty small roles on the show. Yeah, also they seem to struggle to go even two minutes without shoving some Microsoft product in shot. 114 Luffy. And, and our friends at WZWY. <laughs> wow. It's distracting and it makes the world less believable with everyone using Windows phones because we all know that no one uses Windows phones. Let's talk about the gameplay. I was quite surprised to find that this has some of the best third person action I have ever seen. You've got a whole arsenal of time manipulation powers to go along with your guns. Things like a time dash and a time shield. But my favourite was the time stop. This puts enemies into a bubble of time, which lets you overload them with bullets that smash into them all at once. Yeah, it's pretty spectacular, and the time distortion effects are incredible to watch in motion. One thing I didn't like at first, though, is that there's no blind fire from cover, and also you can't just shoot from the hip, you have to aim first. I'm just so used to third-person games letting me do all that. But I can see how that might make you rely too much on hiding in cover, and this is all about getting out there and going crazy with your time powers. Yeah, it does make you feel pretty overpowered, but in a good way. But you can't take many hits, so you do have to use your powers cleverly. Yeah, plus to keep you in check, they do ramp things up and throw tougher enemies at you. Such as guys that are immune to certain powers, or just really heavily armoured guys with weak spots on their back. But even so, not much can stand in your way. Yeah, my only real criticism of the combat is that I just wanted more of it. There isn't enough. <laughs> A lot of the game is mostly wandering about and soaking up story, or solving some light environmental puzzles, which are good. But so is the action, and I wanted a little bit more of that. Yeah, there's a lot of story to soak up, isn't there? The world is full of extra documents and emails and things to snoop through to flesh out the story. A lot of it was a bit TLDR, but I'm glad they put in that extra effort for people who really want to dive deep into the story, like me. We should mention a few technical things. Uh, firstly, if you're playing on PC, you'll be streaming the TV show, which means you need an internet connection. But if you're playing on console, you can download it. Also, apparently this game is running at 720p and it looks amazing. I was just so impressed with the motion capture and the detail. It feels like you're walking around a movie interacting with the actors. By shoving a gun in my face? Yes, a gun. The universal symbol for shut the up and listen to me. Sound logic is always Shh. you. I mean, I say if lower resolutions mean that they can cram in as many effects and graphics as this, more developers should just go for it. Well, we should wrap this up, Bajo. What are you giving it? It's got a great story, cool action, good ideas. I think they took a bit of a gamble with this concept, but it has totally paid off. I'm giving it four and a half out of five stars. Yeah, it was definitely a risk, that whole TV show thing, and some people might still find it a little bit gimmicky, but I think it works. This is great work from Remedy. I'm giving it four and a half as well. So I am down at the Sony office in Sydney where I'm lucky enough to be about to get hands on with Uncharted 4 A Thief's End and guiding me through the experience will be Naughty Dog's Director of Communications, Arnie Meyer. Arnie, thank you very much for joining us. Tell me what I'm about to see in Uncharted 4. Yeah, thanks for having me here. You're in the plains of Madagascar uh, with Sam, Drake and Sully. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking for Henry Avery's treasure. Can you please stop talking so I can play? Yeah, let's do it. Thank you. So. What are we looking for out here? Well, the map shows all these structures around the volcano. Some abandoned outposts, a handful of watchtowers. Watchtowers? Avery was the most wanted man in the world. Avery was, in fact, a real pirate. Yes, he was. Uh, he was a sailor before he was a pirate. Right. Well, I figured that's kind of a prerequisite, right? <laughs> like, you'd be a terrible pirate if you didn't know how to use a boat. Why pick him? Why is he so famous? He was able to get together a bunch of pirates to create a fleet. Yeah, uh, which is something that isn't very common. So he's like putting together the Expendables team for the pirates. Basically, yes. Hey, Victor, what were you arguing with the rental guy? You're a really terrible driver. I'm a terrible driver. <laughs> Hang on, oh, oh god. Before it would be Nate sort of climbing up a cliff, right. and the rocks would start breaking, and he would go ah. Oh. But here it's like three guys in a truck. <laughs> yep. Hey, take this slow, kid. Yeah, yeah. Listen, the old man. 
All right, just gonna ease it around here. Yeah, Sully knows what's up. Look at this, look at this. You were criticizing my driving earlier. <laughs> now I feel like I'm in the right spot because Sam jumped out as well. Yes. Got some big plans for this winch. It's like a real winch, you'll have to wrap it around the tree. And hook it oh, up nice. Itself. Right, so this- <laughs> No this, shortcuts. No, no <laughs> shortcuts. Oh, oh, oh. Well, that looked like fun. Steeper than it looks. <laughs> See, Sully? Winch, totally worth it. Here's my question, how are they planning on getting down? Are we just gonna burn it down the other side of the hill? Oh. Am I spoiling part of the game? <laughs> Feast your eyes, gentlemen. Wow. Spectacular. Whoa. Shit, stop, stop! As you can see over there on the right, there's a little bit there's a little bit of stealth grass that you can start heading into. Yep. So yeah, you can see some enemies. So now if you click down on the left stick, you can mark them. Okay, nice. Oh. Oh. I feel like that would have been a little less silent because he I broke think you've the whole place. Got a guy to your right, actually. Oh. Oh. They've all spotted you. I may have just tried to kill Sully. Oh, yes! Oh, <laughs> thank God. Uh, what's the range on this bad boy? How realistic are shotguns in this game? I can't remember. It's got a pretty decent range. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Jesus, these pirates really need to work on their infrastructure. All right. So again, we another yeah, problem-solving cool. scenario with yeah. the wind. I know exactly what we need to do here. I really hope we're far enough away. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Good job. With the wind, Sully. Sully, just how well do you know Nadine? As Rafe and Nadine are are headed towards uh, Henry Reeves' treasure like you are, what you're seeing is part of their private army ahead of you. Look, shoreline. All right, we're gonna leave it there. So that was Uncharted 4, and it was right here on this television. Now, the Uncharted series has always been really good at giving you the sense of scale. It feels like you're in these giant open environments, but in reality, you're actually being funneled down very sort of narrow directed corridors. They're very well designed and very pretty corridors, and there's lots of plants everywhere, but you are always being funneled towards an end goal. Whereas here, the map that I saw in this playthrough is a way bigger experience. For the first time in the series, I did not know where I was supposed to be going. The shooting still doesn't quite mesh for me in the way that I want it to, but they've introduced this stealth mechanics. And that just removes a lot of the pressure of feeling as though you need to run and gun with mechanics that you may not be entirely comfortable with. They've also added on top of that much more improved NPC behavior. So Sam, uh, Nate's brother and Sully felt like they were way more useful in combat than they have been before. But for me, Uncharted has always been about the story. It seems like every game Nate is putting together like a weird family of criminals to go hunt down some doubloon somewhere. By bringing in his brother, it makes the story way more personal, so I'm hoping it will also completely raise the stakes for Nate. So that was my first taste of Uncharted 4's single player campaign. Will there be a second play? What do you think? The answer is yes. And I'm taking this. Okay, Hicks, I know you're not a huge fan of the Souls series, but I think Dark Souls 3 is gonna be the one to change all that, so I've set up the games room, distraction-free environment. I'm here to support you. All right. I'm going in. Good luck. Right. And remember, death is your reward. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward so far. Ow. Go again, traverse the fog. This is gonna be fine. I hate you! <laughs> what is happening to that guy? Not now! Okay, see you later. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> this is a good time, you're having a good time. I get so far and I get a lot of souls and then I lose all those souls. Yeah, that's part of the reward structure. It's good fun, it's good times.
Ja, da. Nice to see a bit of color. Screech your time! Ah, oh, Dark Souls 3. What a monster of a game. Where to begin? With game director Hiritaka Miyazaki back behind the helm, fans of this series will undoubtedly see how this Souls has benefited from not only new hardware, but from the experimentation with Bloodborne and all the Souls DLC that has come before. It's just incredible work and I want to play it forever. <laughs> yes, and you can. The theme of this game is Ember and fighting the Lords of Cinder to claim their thrones. True to Soul's style, the story is full of cryptic dialogue. We like it is a transposing kiln in thy possession. Strange encounters. Oh, good blade of the dark moon. And plenty of lore to decipher. Pilgrims discover the truth of the old words. I think it's really the world crafting and enemy design that tells the most interesting stories, Bajo. Ugh, oh, and there's so many castles, Bajo, with such detail. Oh, yeah, it's hardcore castle porn. Yeah, and it's a beautifully morbid game, too, full of foul creatures. I don't see any shinies in the graveyard, really. What was that? You get the sense that this surreal universe is set long after the events of previous games, where old kings are dead and new ones slumber over their decaying lands. Also, the enemies are truly terrifying, like legit scary, and not just because they're tough. Yes, as a seasoned Souls player, this game scared the crap out of me. I never want to see this guy again. Or this guy. Holy shit. This creature design is unrivaled, from their blood-curdling screams to their relentless attacks. She's not hurt! <laughs> There's just nothing quite like this out there in video game land. Oh, and the death rattles hex. There's jump scares and sneaky enemies at every turn. There will be times when you'll just end up with your head in your hands trying to deal with it all. I am not a crier, Bajo, but I actually did almost cry at one point. It got bad. No, 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 no. I think I actually did cry at one point, and I swore a lot. He <laughs> jumped up. And at one point while reviewing this hex, I had a dream which was just a giant health bar that went down and down and down until I woke up in a cold sweat. The sneaky stuff in this game feels very bloodborne, but the best part is this still feels like a Souls game. And the AI is so sophisticated, much better than previous games, and they were already pretty great. I love the way the creatures move, Bajo, so fluid and elegant. Also, there's maggots. I am covered in maggots. Oh, the noise of them. <laughs> One kind of new thing is that enemies actually fight each other now, and that can be useful. <laughs> oh, God! Crazy treasures to the rescue! It makes the zones feel more lived in, and along with more interesting patrols and fight setups, you really do feel like this hollowed creature just trying to claw its way through hell and earn the right to exist. Yeah, and you'll never really be fighting the same mob of enemies in the same circumstances. There'll be some new environmental problem or status effect that changes things up. Mm. Or oh, this guy. OK, 
Okay, can we just not show him again, please, Bajo? Who, this guy? No! Every inch of this game has been carefully iterated on and considered and tweaked to the point where if something looks out of place, it's probably an illusory wall. That cleverly drives you to scan and explore every inch of this world, searching for clues in the world design in the never-ending quest for shinies. Those shinies really taunt you. They're saying, hey, put us over here, come get me. And then, death. The world interlocks more now too, like Souls 1 did. But it's a bit denser and more focused, and I think more logical. Go. Shortcut. Shortcut. Oh, another great shortcut. <laughs> it's a glorious puzzle box of pain for you to solve. <laughs> we played this on PC, which has a max cap of 60 frames per second, which is fine, but may annoy some people who like to push higher frame rates. And there's one small zone where the frame rate tanks to unacceptable levels, no matter how many video cards you have. Well, I guess it wouldn't be a Souls game without a blight town. Hex, let's talk fashion. Oh, the gear is beautiful and so much to choose from. Plus, you no longer have to upgrade your gear, which is actually great. Now, you're more inclined to mix up your gear and it truly makes you pick the right outfit for the right fight. Sometimes facing a giant boss in a dress and a pope hat is the way to go. <laughs> They've also tried to make you switch weapons more so that you won't be just upgrading the one weapon and only using that. There's a huge selection too. One useful addition is that you can hold right trigger to charge a more powerful attack. Thanks again, Bloodborne. Weapons also have their own unique movesets now. Shield breaks, charges and leaps. Like everything, I found these really tricky to master. Did you use the special moves much? Not at first, but once I started using them, I realised their massive potential for changing those tougher fights. And I imagine in PvP, they'll be absolutely essential. I'm enjoying pyromancy in this zone. Charges are gone, you just have one mana bar to manage all magic. And you can tell they've worked hard to make magic, miracles and pyromancy a more effective playstyle. Yeah, pyro is so good now. I especially love putting that flame on my sword. Oh. Ah, so cool. Apparently this Souls game supports six players online and has dedicated servers, which is great. Oh, get him in the butt, quick, Pete! Get him in the butt! Get him in the ball! Get but we couldn't really test out PvP much because there weren't many people playing at the time of review. Invaded by Dark Spirit, I'll make Sonic. <laughs> oh, I'm embered. We did manage to play a bit of co-op together, though. Hey, buddy. Oh, nice. Yeah, it certainly makes the game less painful to have a friend share it with you. Why are you blue? Oh, you look I'm terrifying. Sonic. I'm old mate Sonic. I just don't really feel like your look is really authentic with the world. <laughs> Gotta go fast. fast. Gotta roll fast. Gotta roll fast, Hex. <laughs> that frozen dog boss still smashed us, though. Yeah. All right. Start hacking at a spot. But if he turns around, run, 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 run. No! No! He's coming for you, run! Run, no! run! No! No! He's on me now, he's on me! <laughs> oh, you went all the way! Roll away! Oh, that hurt. Oh, oh dear, no! <laughs> he got me. The host of Ember died. <laughs> I really liked how the design of the bosses really represent everything that's in the zone they're lording over. And you really do feel like each enemy is hunting you and stalking you. I wanted to ask you as a seasoned Dark Souls player, you know, I heard all this hype leading up that this was the hardest Dark Souls ever. Would you say that's true? Some parts are and some parts aren't. I think the bosses are more fun and complex than the other games by far. I think there are too many bonfires, though. You think there should be less bonfires? Yeah, absolutely. Really? There's one point where you can actually see two of them in one spot. Oh, no. Come on. 
And the NPCs that you can take into fights tank so hard, it actually makes some of those battles a breeze. I think if you put all the Souls games side by side and you hadn't played any of them, then yes, this would be the toughest one. But, you know, maybe ask me after I've started New Game Plus, which I'm doing tonight, because that's where the real fight begins. No! Oh, I got me. So tell me, Hex, after this Dark Souls game, this incredible Dark Souls game, are you now a fan? I'm so sorry, but no. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is an incredible game. There is no denying that. It's masterfully created and sets out to give Dark Souls fans all the challenge and complexity and beauty they could ask for. But I honestly, I, I still can't call myself a fan of this kind of gruelling gameplay. I felt for sure this was the one that was going to convince I, I, Look, It just comes down to it not being the kind of experience that I look for in a game. That kind of frustration and and real anger. I felt real anger. It, it, I had bad feelings in me. Just the constant repetition of having to go back and replay the same section over and over. It's just... It's just not for me. But that's the fun part. Replaying these sections over and over again and mastering them, making the game fear you instead of the other way around. Bajo, I've seen you play this game. Does this look like someone who's having a good time? time on the inside. I do, in a way, understand where the love for this game comes from, but I just, I can't share in it. I honestly hate putting myself through it. It makes me feel emotions that are so demoralizing that I have to remind myself that I play games to escape and feel good, not hate myself and cry. Tears of joy, Hex. Tears of joy. <laughs> well, I don't think you'll be alone in that opinion, you know, but it does make me sad because no other game gives me the same sense of satisfaction I get from Souls. Nothing even comes close. I loved this. And the best part is for returning players, there are new ways of fighting to learn in what was already a delicate and robust combat system. And I think all that works. Dark Souls 3 begs you to master it and then punishes you for thinking that you can. I'm giving it five stars. Well, I can absolutely appreciate what From Software has built with the Souls games. And I'm giving this four out of five because I can respect that and I can see the depth there. But I will also be very happy if I never have to even look at this game again. Screenshot. Oh, TV's Bajo. You're on Rage, mate. Rage? Oh, out of all the TV shows that I could have glitched into that have ever existed, it happens to be an ABC one that's just around the corner from my office. Ah! Ah! I'm going again! again. Help! Help! Mommy! Where will I go? Where will I go? Please! Ah! Hey, um, did TV's Bajo just glitch through here? Uh, yeah, I think he went, uh, that way. Oh, thanks. Oh, hey, is this Rage? Yeah. Oh, man. Do you, um, do you have that song, uh, Did You Name the Game for this week? I do. It was King's Field on the PlayStation 1 from 1994. This first-person dungeon crawler, originally only released in Japan, pit you against deadly monsters and tricky traps as you attempted to uncover the fate of your missing father. And it's our name the game because it was the very first game developed by From Software, the same team behind this week's Dark Souls 3. Yeah, and you can see the connection. Next week in the show, we experience the perils of being stranded in outer space in a drift. Plus, you can catch more good game with Pocket and our eSports show Well Played, both on iView. Over on Spawn Point on ABC3 this weekend, we beat up some Pokemon in Pokken Tournament. <laughs> Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Oh, do out. <laughs> there, there. There, there. I'm dying and dying. Death is your reward. It's over and over and back to the bonfire and then I have to do it all again. Yeah, it's, it's really fun.